One of the themes of this surah is all about Allah's power, right? From the very first ayah. When Musa lati urfa. The power of Allah to send the angels. The power of Allah Azza wa Jal to send the wind. The power of Allah to destroy the people. And the power of Allah that you cannot escape. Because الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد so there are a couple of things before we begin that I would like to address and kind of clarify or speak about before we begin the class today. The first is that many of the sisters were telling us that the sound is not very loud. So there are two things we're going to do today. The first thing is I'm going to try to really speak as loud as possible into the microphone, which is a little difficult for the brothers because the echo is quite strong on our side. But we'll try our best. But we also require from the sisters for them to make a really big effort to be as quiet as possible. I know it's difficult, especially if they have children uh, in the gathering. It can be difficult, but it's really important for them to make the room as quiet as possible so that they can hear as much of the class as possible. If we're still having a problem after the day, then inshallah ta'ala what we will do is we will try our very best to give them a different solution. Some kind of stream or some kind of audio, separate audio or something like that, inshallah ta'ala. The second question or the second issue is that the brothers asked last week about the best print of Al-Misbah Al-Munir fi Tahdidi Tafsir ibn Kathir. And it is this one. It's this one here. It's the Dar al Salam print. And it is the latest one of them, which says, This one is the best print that I found. There are a couple of other prints. There is an Indi another print from India. And there are the old Dar al Salam prints. But this one is really very good. And I mean, we can only speak about what we know, but from what I found, this one is the best print in Arabic. As for in English, Dar es Salaam do have a copy in 10 volumes. It's not called Al Misbah Al Munir. It's not. It's called a summary of Ibn Kathir, something like that. It's called Summarized Ibn Kathir in 10 volumes, printed by Dar es Salaam publishers. It's available here in Dubai, in Dwar. And it's also available in their shop in Sharjah. So you can get hold of that if you want. But you can't buy the individual volumes. So you can't buy just Juz Tabarak. I asked them today, I went to the shop, I said to them, can I just buy Juz Tabarak? In English, they said, no, you have to take all 10, all 10 volumes. There could be a question which some people could ask. They could say, why are we using uh, al Misbah al -Muni? So we have a number of books in tafsir, right? And tafsir books, they can be categorized into probably three categories or more than that, maybe four categories that we can speak about books of tafsir. So we have tafsir in terms of al-mufradat. What is the meaning of individual words? Not a proper tafsir, just what does this word mean and this word mean and this word mean? And this is most commonly found in the translations of the Qur'an, the translation of the meaning that you buy when you buy the Muhsin Khan translation or you buy the Sahih International translation, what you, or even if you buy Dar es Salaam's word-for-word -word translation of the Qur'an, you're really getting ma'ani al-mufradat. What do the individual words mean? And then you have a tafsir al-mujman. What we would call a highly summarized tafsir, where you are not getting any differences of opinion, you are not getting any uh, different ways of understanding the ayah, you're not even getting probably more than one sentence or two sentences for each ayah, but you're getting an overview and an understanding according to the author of that particular book of 
tafsir that you're looking at. An example of this would be tafsir al-Jalalain. Uh, likewise, some of the smaller books of, of uh, tafsir, Zubdat al-Tafsir, these small books, are also available in English as well. One thing I would say is that I wouldn't advise you to study al-Jalalain without a teacher. With a teacher, it's an excellent book and very beneficial, but it does require a teacher to help you to understand it, even if it's printed in English. But an example of a summarized tafsir that you could read for yourself in English just comfortably would be tafsir al-Sa'di, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, and it's published in, I think, 10 volumes in the English language as well. You can find a translation, and even you can find Juz Amma and Juz Tabarak, which is available, I believe, again from Dar salam if I'm not mistaken, tafsir al-Sa'di, rahimahullah ta'ala, and you can read it by yourself comfortably. You can just read it and you don't have to worry. There is nothing in there that is wrong or that would give you concern or that needs explanation. And then you have a tafsir al mufassal Detailed, broken down tafsir. Where you start to talk about different opinions. And you start to talk about all the different scholars who said this. And the ayah which support this. And the ahadith which support that. And why does this come from this? Now there's some degree of detail in there. And these books, there are many different angles. Some of them are Tafsir al Quran ibn Quran. Primarily, they speak about what does the Quran say about the Quran. And when the Quran explains the meaning of another ayah in the Quran, like the book of Wa'al Bayan uh, by uh, Sheikh Muhammad Amin Shanqiti, uh, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And you also have books that focus not only on the Qur'an, but they focus on al mafu they focus on what is narrated. So they focus on Qur'an, on Hadith, and on statements of the Sahaba, things that you have a narration for, and that includes the tafsir of Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, which is the most comprehensive and detailed book of tafsir that we have, and that hasn't been translated into English. And we have Tafsir Ibn Kathir, which is in some ways a summary of what Ibn Jarir wrote, except that Ibn Kathir added some of his own opinions and, and choices onto it. But you can consider Ibn Kathir in some ways to almost be a summary of what Al Tabari, Ibn Jarir Al Tabari, what he brought, along with Ibn Kathir's own choices and preferences and opinions along with it. Ibn Kathir by itself is very big, right? It's huge. In Arabic, it's huge. But if we could have a summary of it, that means we're getting some differences of opinion, we're getting some ayat, ahadith, we're getting some statements of the Sahaba, but not so much that it leaves us confused, and not so that we're taking you know, one ayah a lesson. So that's why we came to the summary of Ibn Kathir and in my view, one of the best summaries of Ibn Kathir is this summary that we have here, Al-Misbah, Al-Munir, and it was supervised by Al-Mubarak Furi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He summarized, he, he, if you like, supervised a number of people who worked on it. And the other reason why we chose it is it's widely available in English. So it's easy for people to go back to it. Having said that, knowing that it is a type of detailed tafsir, do you think it's easy to read by itself? I was surprised actually that the first or one of the first books of tafsir to be translated into English was Ibn Kathir. Not because it's not a good book, it's amazing, but because it's actually quite difficult. It's not a book that you can sit and read by yourself. Sometimes I read it, just a summary, I read it three, four, five times and still I don't understand it until I go back to what my teacher said and I look at the notes and I add things to it. It's not that easy, but it's a nice book to explain and it's nice for us because what we can do is sometimes bring Ibn Jarir al-Tabari's opinions in there and together we can get a really nice summarized tafsir which has a little bit of detail in it and it's something more than me just telling you the meanings that you can read you know, by yourself or you can read at home. Another type of tafsir which you should be aware of is a specialized tafsir. That is tafsir that specializes in something. 
for example, specializes in halal and haram, the rulings of halal and haram, like al qurtubi uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, things like that. You could also be aware that sometimes the book of tafsir is written only for one specific goal. For example, the tafsir of the ayat of halal and haram, and so on. So that's also useful for you to know. So that's a nice little overview of why we chose this book. And as we said, this print seems to be one of the best that we have available to us. Now, I got kind of uh, advised last week, and it's very true, that maybe there was a little bit too much Arabic in the class last week. So I will endeavor not to make that mistake this week, inshallah, and to try my best. However, I do also believe that it is important to read at least the original quote in Arabic. Otherwise, you're really just taking what I think about it. You're not really taking what Ibn Kathir said. You're just taking my view of what Ibn Kathir said. And it's much better for you to take what he said and then later on when you listen to it, you can say, see Muhammad Tim here said it means this. I don't think he was entirely, I don't think he was entirely correct about that. So we reached the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, the eight yom in Ujilat, the yom in Fas, Wama Adarakama yom in Fas, Wailu yoma idin lil mukadibin. Ibn Kathir, he says, Yakul ta'ala, the eight yom in Ujilat in Rusul, Wa Urjia amruha hatta takuma sa'a, Kama kala ta'ala fala tahsaban Allah muhli for wadi hi usula, in Allah azizun puntiqam. Then he says, Wahu yom in Fas. كما قال تعالى ليوم الفصل ثم قال تعالى معظما لشأنه وما أدراك ما يوم الفصل ويل يوم إذ للمكذبين أي ويل لهم من عذاب الله غدا. So let me translate to you what he said and then we'll explain it and then we'll go again through what Ibn Kathir said. So he spoke about the ayah لأي يوم أجلت ليوم الفصل وما أدراك ما يوم الفصل ويل يوم إذ للمكذبين. This is the these are the four ayat that he's speaking about here. He says, Allah the Exalted said, Which day has this been delayed for? These things that Allah spoke about, which day is it going to be that Allah has delayed these things to happen on that day? And that the, the, this matter is going to take place on that day. It's going to be when the hour will come. As Allah said, فَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ مُخْلِفَ وَعْدِهِ رُسُولَهِ Don't believe or don't have the false impression that Allah would ever break His promise to His messengers. And that promise to the messengers is the promise of what will happen in the Akhirah. The promise of all the things you have been you have been told. And that's why Allah Azza wa said, Innama tu'adun lawaqib. What you have been promised is definitely going to happen. What you have been promised is certainly going to happen. And what was given to the messengers and what the messengers were promised is certainly going to happen. It's going to happen on Yawm al -Fasr. Then he says, it is Yawm al -Fasr. al -Fasr means separation. Why is it called the day of separation? Because this is the day in which Allah Azza wa Jal will separate truly between the people of Iman who believe in Allah and the people who didn't believe in Allah. And Allah will separate even among the believers between those who will have the high station and those who will have less than that. So on that day, Allah will categorize the people and Allah will separate each people and Allah will bring every nation with its messenger. This is why Allah speaks about this day as Yawm al Fasl, as Allah said, the Yawm al Fasl. And then Allah said, Ibn Kathir, he says, Allah tells us the greatness of this day, the severity of this day, how important this day is. What will make you know what this day of separation is? This, whenever you hear, or in the Quran, even though it means, how will you know? The meaning of it is ta'adhimu li sha'nihi. It's making it something severe in your heart. Whenever Allah says, wa ma adaraka, how will you know what this is? And it's something very, very serious 
and very important, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a great status, and that's why Allah asks you, what will make you know what it is? It's a kind of a rhetorical question where Allah asks you and then tells you what it is. Woe to that day, woe on that day for those who will deny. What does this word wail mean? We covered it in Juz'am. The word wail, some of them said it means, it's a word meaning destruction. So it's as though Allah Azza wa Jal is invoking destruction upon these people. Ibn Jarir rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Wadin fil Jahannam. It is a valley in Jahannam. So whether it is a valley in Jahannam, or whether it is a general word which means destruction, it's a statement of rebuke and a statement of something evil for these people who Allah describes. Who does Allah say will have this destruction? Who does Allah say will have this valley in Jahannam? al muqaddimin those who deny. Now here I want to pause for a moment and I want to remind you about something which I think is really important in tafsir. In the whole of tafsir, every time you read the Quran, you must notice that many ayat are repeated over and over again. For example, all of us have heard Surah Al-Rahman. In this surah, the word it comes ten times. Ten times. But we have a principle in tafsir, and that is that there is nothing which is really repeated in the Quran. Why do we say there is nothing repeated in the Quran? Because repetition, it goes against eloquence, bala, generally. And you don't, when you say something over and over again for no reason, it's considered to be lacking eloquence. Part of eloquence is that you say what you need to say in the fewest words with the most powerful speech. And we know the Quran is the most beautiful speech and the most eloquent. So from this, the scholars of Tafsir say there isn't repetition in the Quran. Every time the ayah comes again, it holds a different meaning to what it held before. Let me give you an example. Let's look at Surah Al-Rahman. Which of the ayat of your Lord do the two of you, jinn and men, deny? Every time this ayah comes, there is an ayah before it, which mentions what? It mentions an ayah from the ayat of Allah. It mentions something that Allah bestowed, a ni'mah, or a blessing, or a sign of Allah. And so each time this is repeated, it's actually repeated in line with the ayah which came before. So when Allah mentions, for example, the sea, Maraj al al and the barrier between them that doesn't cross. When Allah mentions now denying the signs and the blessings of your Lord, it is to deny this, to deny this blessing. Then again, it's to deny the next blessing, and then again the next one. So here, what it means is this. Every ayah that comes before, this is the takzeeb which is intended, the denial which is intended. So which ayah came before when Allah said, The first one says, So this now ayah refers to the people who deny the day of resurrection. The next time it comes, it refers to a different kind of denial. And the next time to a different kind of denial. And the next time to a different kind. So yes, it is the words are repeated. But the meaning is not repeated. Each time the meaning holds a different meaning to the one that came before. And if you wanted a bit more explanation of this, we spoke about it in the Tafsir of Surah Al-Kafirun. About how the meaning changes for each phrase, even if the words are exactly the same, the meaning changes. How do you know what meaning it is? Go to the ayah before. As if you drew a line, from this ayah to the ayah before, 
this is what is intended by al mukaddibin al mukaddibin the people who denied what Allah mentioned in the previous ayat. So up to now, what has Allah mentioned? He mentioned what will happen at the time of the coming of the hour. When the stars will be extinguished, the mountains will turn to dust, on the day when the earth will be replaced with another earth, on the day when the messengers will be brought at a particular time, and the enemies of the messengers will have to stand in front of Allah and explain why they denied the messenger. All of those things that will happen. War or destruction or a valley in Jahannam will be for those people who deny Yawm al who deny the day when the people will be separated. And actually, one of the brothers asked a very, very good question last week. The question came, regarding the connection between what Allah swore by in the beginning of the surah and what Allah told us what you have been promised is going to happen and we said that this is from the evidences of Allah's power over his creation and this happens a lot in the Quran that Allah speaks about his power over creation and his control over them and what he can do to them and what he has done to the people who came before in order to show them that the resurrection is something that will happen that there will be a day when the people will come back to life and Allah will ask them about what they did Ibn Kathir he says he said, woe to them for the punishment of Allah that will happen tomorrow. This punishment could come to someone at any time. And these people are denying what will happen. They are denying that they will be brought back to life when they die. Remember, this surah is Makiya. It's talking to the people of Quraysh, who many of them denied that people will come back to life. But they believe that Allah is the one who sent the wind. They believed that Allah destroyed people who came before. They believed in the angels that Allah Azza wa Jal sent one after the other. So if you believe in these things, why would you not believe that Allah is going to bring you back to life and separate between the people who did good and the people who did bad? Then we come to the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. أَلَمْ نُهْلِكِ الْأَوَّلِينَ ثُمَّ نُتْبِعُهُمُ الْآخِرِينَ كَذَلِكَ نَفْعَلُ بِالْمُجْرِمِينَ وَيْلُ الْيَوْمَ إِذِنْ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ Ibn Kathir, he says, يَقُولُ تَعَالَى أَلَمْ نَهْلُكُمْ He says, يَقُولُ تَعَالَى أَلَمْ نُهْلِكِ الْأَوَّلِينَ يَعْنِي مِنَ الْمُكَذِّبِينَ لِلْرُسُلِ الْمُخَالِفِينَ لِمَا جَاءُوهُمْ بِهِ مِمَّنْ أَشْبَاهَهُمْ وَلِهَادَ قَالَ تَعَالَى كَذَلِكَ نَفْعَلُ بِالْمُجْرِمِينَ وَيْلُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ قَالَهُ مُجْرِيرُ Ibn Kathir, he says, Allah says, the exalted, أَلَمْ نُهْبِكِ الْأَوَّلِينَ Didn't we destroy the early people? This is something that the people of Quraysh knew about. And that's why at the end of Surah Al-Najm, when Allah mentions all the people that he destroyed, all of the people, Ad and Thamud, and the people of Lut, and all the people that Allah destroyed, that is why Quraysh were gripped with fear when these ayat were revealed. Because they knew these stories. It was not like somebody said to them, Ad, and they said, who is Ad? We don't know who is Ad. They knew about Allah's destruction of these people. So Allah says, didn't we destroy the early people? ثُمَّ نُتْبِعُهُمُ الْآخِرِينَ Now here the scholars of tafsir, they differ on this. Who is Allah talking about when he says, then we followed or we will follow with others? And why they differ is, is this ayah talking about the past or the future? 
Ibn Jarir, he says, this ayah is talking about the future. In other words, Allah says, didn't we destroy the people in the past? And won't we destroy you people in the future? And they brought us an evidence for this, a qira'ah, which is shadda. Now, we understand that the Qur'an is what we read in the Mus'haf, right? And we know there are different styles of reading the Qur'an. For all of these styles that you hear, uh, sometimes the Imam reads uh, the Qira or Bisa'i in Salat al-Isha, or he reads Warsh. He, when you hear these different styles of reading, all of them still match the Mus'haf of Uthman radiallahu anhu. And they don't go outside of the original writing of the Mus'haf. Okay? Yes, the words might sound different. Yes, the ba might become a ta or the ta might become a noon. But the actual shape of the word doesn't change. Sometimes there are narrations of reciting the Quran from the Sahaba which don't match the Mus'haf at all. Or which are not narrated in a way that is enough people to give us that confidence of it coming from the Qur'an. These are called Qira'atun Shadda. They are rare or unusual ways of reciting. Sometimes there's an additional word, sometimes an additional letter, but it doesn't match the Mus'haf of Uthman. So someone would say, what do we think about this? It's very simple. This for us, we can use it for tafsir, but we don't recite it in our prayer. We don't recite it in our prayer. There is a qira'ah like this, which says, uh, with this ayah, ثُمَّ Then we will destroy others after them later. With the word will, I mean, we will do it. This can be a tafsir for us, because it's authentic. But it doesn't match the Mus'haf. So we don't consider it to be Qur'an. We don't call it Qur'an. But we do consider it at the least level. At the minimum, it's a tafsir for us. Because some of the Sahaba used to recite it. And they heard it from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is where we talk about, when we talk about different styles of reciting, we are talking about two different styles. We're talking about a style of recitation which is narrated it's narrated by so many people there's no doubt about it and it matches the Mus'haf of Uthman it matches the Mus'haf that the Sahaba agreed upon this we recite it we recite it so for example we recite Maliki Yawmiddin and we recite Maliki Yawmiddin both of them match the Mus'haf of Uthman and both of them are reported from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by so many people, there is no doubt in it. But if we find a Sahabi brought another word or another letter that doesn't match, now the minimum that we have, at least, at least we have tafsir. Minimum, we have tafsir. So this statement, it's not Quran for us, but it is tafsir for us. And so we could use that to show that this ayah is speaking about the future. Uh, this is, sorry, the opinion of, uh, I said Ibn Jarir, it's not Ibn Jarir who said this. I said Ibn Jarir, right? Yeah, it's not Ibn Jarir who said this, Ibn Kathir said this. Ibn Jarir, he took them both in the past. He said, Alam al The earliest people Allah destroyed. Then we followed up with other people that we destroyed before you. Is that clear? Ibn Jarir, he took it, both of them in the past. That the first ayah, Alam Muhlikil Awwaleen, didn't we destroy the first people? And then we also destroyed others. So Allah destroyed the people of Nuh, the first people. And then Allah destroyed many people after them, Ad and Thamud, and the people of Lut, and the people, how many people? How many nations Allah destroyed after that? So Ibn Jarir, he said, Allah is telling them, we destroyed the very first people and we kept on destroying people after them. 
Ibn Kathir, it seems like he takes it for the future. And if we destroy people and we will destroy other people. And both of them are true, right? Allah destroyed the first people of Nuh. Then Allah destroyed many other nations. When did Allah destroy them? When they were mukhadibin. When they denied the message. When they denied the messengers. When they didn't believe in the Rusul, in the Prophets. والسلام, Allah destroyed nation after nation after nation. This is what we do with the criminals. Now Allah Azza wa Jalla, if there is any doubt, Allah is telling you for sure. We destroyed the first people. Then we destroyed other people. And we will do this to every group of people who, dis who disbelieve in the messengers. Alayhim salatu wassalam, they are threatened with the same destruction that came from those people. This is what we do. This is the sunnah of Allah with the people who commit the crime of denying the revelation, denying the messenger. We're going to destroy them like we destroyed the people of Nuh and all the people who came after them. Then now, what is the mukaddibin here? Those people who denied that Allah will destroy them like Allah destroyed the early people. For example, some of the people from Quraysh, they denied this. They said, we don't think that Allah is going to do anything to us. We don't think that Allah is going to punish us. You denied Yom al-Fasr, you denied the Day of Resurrection. And now you deny that Allah has or that Allah will punish you like He punished the other people. Ibn Kathir he says, فَمَّقَالَ تَعَالَى مُمْتَنًّا عَلَى خَلْقِهِ وَمُحْتَجًّا عَلَى الْعِعَادَةِ بِالْبُدَاءَةِ أَلَمْ نَخْلُقْهُمْ مِنْ مَا هِمَّهِينَ أي ضعيف حقير بالنسبة إلى قدرة الباري عز وجل كما في حديث بصر ابن جحاش ابن آدم أن تعجزني وقد خلقتك من مثل هذه Now Ibn Kathir comes on to talk about the ayah ألم نخلقكم من ماء مهين Did we not create you from a water, a liquid, which is something lowly in your eyes. Ibn Kathir, when he speaks about this, he says, So there are two things we can take about this. Human beings are created from a drop, from a nutra. This drop is something insignificant. It's insignificant in two ways. Ibn Kathir, he mentions one of them, and I'm going to mention another one. It's insignificant in terms of the power of Allah. Imagine this human being came from this drop. What is this drop in comparison to Allah and His power? How can a human being have pride and arrogance before Allah? When this human being came from a drop which is nothing in the sight of Allah Azza wa Jal. And Ibn Kathir mentions something beneficial here. He says this is, Allah Azza wa Jal says this, mumtannan wa muhtajja. Allah is telling you the blessings that He gave you. That Allah brought you to this status of honor. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. We certainly honored the children of Adam. And Allah gave you this honor that now look how you walk on the earth. Kiraman, with honor and dignity, where did Allah bring you from? He brought you from a single drop. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He gives you the evidence of resurrection from how you began. So the one who brought you from a single drop, isn't that one able to bring you from something bigger than that? 
if what is left is that bone in the bottom of your spine. That bone is a lot bigger than a drop, right? That bone that is left from the dead in the bottom of your spine is so much bigger than a drop. How could a person deny that Allah will bring them back again when Allah brought you in the first place from a single drop? But there is another issue here. It's not just that this drop is insignificant in the sight of Allah, but even for us, it's something maheen, something not very nice, something that you, you wash it off, you clean it, you don't leave it on yourself. You consider it something not dirty, but something not nice. And Allah Azza wa Jal brought you from it. So how can you have that arrogance and pride? Oh, disbeliever, the one who doesn't believe in Allah. So much arrogance and pride when you came from something. If it fell onto your clothes, you would wash it off. And you would clean it. And here it's not only talking about the drop that comes from a man, but also what comes from the woman as well. Ibn Kathir mentions this. Not only what comes from the man, but what comes from the woman. So what comes from those parts it's something maheen. It's not something amazing and, and honorable and you raise its status up. You clean it, you, you consider it to be a bit dirty, you wash it off. And Allah created you from that. So you cannot have any arrogance before Allah. And then to know that the one who created you from that drop is the one who is able to bring you back again after you die. And Allah speaks to the, the deniers, the disbelievers here. Allah speaks to them in a way like they know this. You people know what you were created from. You know that you were created from this drop. You know that you came from something which is maheen. It's lowly. And it's not something that you honor. It's something you wash away. You know Allah brought you to life from this. So how can you deny that Allah will bring you back again? Yawm al qiyamah and he brings for this the hadith of Ibn Jihash in which Allah Azza wa Jal says, hadith Qudusi, hadith which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi narrates from Allah, that Allah says, Ibn Adam, anna tu'ajizuni wa qad khalaqtuka min mithli hadith. O son of Adam, how will you escape me when I created you from something like this? How do you think? Now, this is the power of Allah. One of the themes of this surah is all about Allah's power, right? From the very first ayah, when Musa lati urfa, the power of Allah to send the angels, the power of Allah Azza wa to send the wind, the power of Allah to destroy the people, and the power of Allah that you cannot escape. Because Allah Azza wa Jal, if He created you from this drop, which is da'if, it's so weak. How do you think from this that you will have the power to escape Allah Yawm al -qiyamah, on the day of resurrection? O oh, son of Adam, how will you escape me while I created you from this? Then Allah Azza wa Jal said, فَجَعَلْنَاهُ فِي قَرَارٍ مَكِينٍ Here Ibn Kathir, he says, جَمَعْنَاهُ فِي الرَّحِمٍ وَهُوَ قَرَارُ الْمَاءِ مِنَ الرَّجُلِ وَالْمَرْأَةِ وَالرَّحِمُ مُعَدٌّ لِذَلِكَ حَافِظٌ لِمَا أُودِعَ فِيهِ أو بما أودع فيه من الماء. He says, Allah Azza wa Jal, when Allah says, فَجَعَلْنَاهُ فِي قَرَارِ الْمَكِينِ We put it into a strong and safe place. And in this drop that came, we put it into a place that protects it and a place that is strong and a place that keeps it safe. The womb. The womb. Ibn Kathir, he says, i.e. we gathered this water together in the womb from the drops that come from the man and the woman. And the womb, it is designed for this. And he, Allah designed it to be a place of protection and a place of safety for the baby to grow until it is born into this world. Some of them say 
that the womb is from the strongest of the parts of the human body from the womb. And the baby is protected from all sides, from every way, and it's protected from the woman's abdomen, it's protected from the liquid that the baby is inside, is growing inside of. That whole place is protected and safe for that drop to grow into a human being. And it keeps safe what is put into it. إِلَىٰ قَدَرٍ مَعْلُونَ For a time that is known. Allah keeps the baby safe in the womb for a particular length of time that Allah decrees. And that time is a time that is well known. Ma'room. Everyone knows how long that time is. Ibn Kathir, he said, إِلَىٰ مُدَّةٍ مُعَيَّنَةٍ مِنْ سِتَّةِ أَشْهُرٍ أَوْ تِسْعَةٍ أَوْ تِسْعَةِ أَشْهُرٍ He said, it is a fixed length of time between six and nine months. Where did the scholars take from this between six and nine months? They didn't take it from medicine. Nobody came and asked the doctor, how long does the baby stay for before the baby is born? Rather, they took it from the statement of Allah, وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ وَحَمْلُهُ وَفِصَالُهُ ثَلَاثُونَ شَهْرًا that the baby is carried and weaned in 30 months. That the baby is carried and weaned for 30 months. The weaning of the baby is the, the breastfeeding and then the giving of the food until the baby eats food and stops drinking its mother's milk. And Allah said the carrying of the baby and the Feeding of the baby is 33 months. How did we get from this six months? Mothers, they feed their children for two full years for whoever wants to complete the weaning period. 30 months take away 24 months gives you six months. And that is why when a woman was brought before some of the Sahaba uh, عنهم, and she had given birth after six months, some of the people brought her and they said, she was not, this birth is not allowed and she committed zina. Because she gave birth to the baby in six months and the baby was healthy. The baby was born after six months healthy. And they would have applied the punishment to her, except that one of the Sahaba recited the ayah. Thirty take away twenty forty six. Let her go. There's nothing wrong with giving birth to a child after six months. And nine months is usual, right? Everybody knows that nine months is the normal term for a baby. But here Allah Azza wa Jalla tells us that the length of time the baby spends with his mother in his mother's womb is decreed by Allah. Allah decreed it for that time. And all of this is giving an evidence against these people who claim that we will not be resurrected. We're not going to be brought back to death, brought back to life again after we die. Really? The one who created you from this drop, the one who kept you safe for between six and nine months, the one who caused you to be born and then caused you to grow into an adult and gave you your rushed, your wisdom and your intellect. Really, you believe that one cannot create you again? And he's giving Quraysh what they already believe in. They don't, they don't deny. They know they were created from a nutfah, from a drop. They know that Allah keeps it safe. They don't believe their idols keep it safe. They don't believe that Allah and al uzza cause the baby to be born. They believe it's from Allah. But still they deny the resurrection. And the message of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَقَدَرْنَا فَنِعْمَ الْقَادِرُونَ وَيْلٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ لِلْمُكَذِّبِينَ فَقَدَرْنَا 
there is another recitation which is from the well-known recitations that the Imams read in the prayer. فَقَدَّرْنَا What's the difference between the two? So we need to go to another principle of tafsir here. We need to bring, uh, I'm just watching the time, we need to bring another principle of tafsir here, which is that whenever you have an ayah which can be read more than one way, you can make tafsir of both of them separately as though they were two separate ayat. In other words, it's like you're getting an ayah extra on top of the ayah that you already have. So you can make tafsir of فَقَدَرْنَا and you can make another tafsir فَقَدَرْنَا Some of the scholars of tafsir say they have the same meaning. It's just the recitation is different but the meaning is the same. That Allah decreed it. فَنِعْمَ الْقَادِرُونَ That Allah Azza wa Jal decreed it. And how excellent is the decree of Allah? How excellent is Allah as one who decrees everything that will happen? What does Allah decree? Allah decrees, as He said, the birth of the child. How many people don't have children? They try to have children, they cannot have children. فَقَدَرْنَا فَنِعْمَ الْقَادِرُ it's Allah who decreed it and Allah is the best of those who decree. How many are there who have a child? Will that child be born early? Will that child be born after nine months? Will the child be born healthy? Will the child be born sick? It's Allah's decree and how excellent is Allah as the one who decrees. But if we make a difference between the two ways of reciting and if we say, Qadarna is one and Qadarna is a different meaning. Then Qadarna, it's referring to Qadar. It's referring to Al Qadar, Allah's decree. We decreed it, and what an excellent decree is the decree of Allah, and how excellent is Allah as one to decree. There is no decree better than the decree of Allah. And no decree more complete than the decree of Allah. But what does it mean then? فَقَدَرْنَا Some of them said فَمَلَكْنَا We own it or we control it. They said it means التصرف, That Allah is the one that has complete and total control over everything that happens in this world. Because the word Qadr originally comes from what? Qudra, right? Power. That's why sometimes you hear Laylatul Qadr, people translate it as the night of the decree, and sometimes people translate Laylatul Qadr as the night of power. Because the word Qadr, it means decree, taqdeer, and it means al-qudra, power, and ability. So here Allah Azza wa Jal tells us His decree, and He tells us His power, and he tells us that he has complete control over everything that happens in this world. And no one has control over this universe except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Woe to those people who deny. Okay, what are they denying here? In the first ayah, they denied Yawm al Fasl. In the second ayah, what was it we said? Where did we say? What did we say for the second ayah? That, that Allah is origin, the destruction of the people, yes. We said that those who deny that Allah will destroy the people who reject the messenger. Here, those who deny Allah's qadr or those who deny Allah's control, those who deny Allah's decree, those who deny Allah's control. And we know that denying Qadr, it destroys your deeds. The hadith of Jibreel, alayhi salatu wasalam, when Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu, narrates from his father Umar, the whole hadith of Jibreel, why, why did Abdullah ibn Umar narrate that whole hadith? He narrated it as an evidence against the people who said, an la qadr. There is no decree from the decree of Allah. And everything is random. And he, it's just random. There is no decree. Those people who deny the decree of Allah, 
they are also threatened. Woe to those people who deny Allah's decree and Allah's control of everything that happens in this universe. Allah's decree, Allah's decree, it comes really back to two things. It comes back to Allah's power and it comes back to Allah's knowledge. Oh. Because taqdeer, the ability to decree something, it comes back to al-ilmu wal qudra It comes back to knowledge and power. That Allah knows everything that will happen and that Allah controls everything and nothing can escape his knowledge and his power. And that's why even you see sometimes the people of Quraysh at that time used to have issues with Allah's knowledge. They used to say, some of them used to say, we don't think that Allah knows everything that we do. <laughs> Woe to those people who deny Allah's decree or they deny Allah's knowledge or they deny Allah's power or those who deny that Allah will resurrect the people after he created them. We will stop there, inshallah ta'ala, and take questions after the adhan. That is what Allah Azza wa Jalla made easy for me to mention Allah is best. Wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. As we did last week, inshallah ta'ala, we will take uh, some questions, inshallah, for about 10 minutes, and then we will stop to give people time to go and make a door and to come back uh, for the jama'ah. Inshallah. From the latest matters of the last weekend. Wallahi, Tafsir Muyassar is again an example of a simplified Tafsir, right? An example of a Tafsir which just gives you maybe one line or a few words for each ayah. I honestly can't remember the last time, I remember looking through it, but I can't remember the last time that I read it beginning to end. But there are some good books like that. There are some books like Tafsir al Zubdat al-Tafsir. These books that give you a good summary. When we teach, actually what we teach in our institute, we teach Tafsir al-Jalalayn. But we teach it with a, with a teacher because it, it needs a little bit of caution when going through it. And it, it's also not that easy to understand as well. And generally, you find something about books. The older the book is, usually, the harder it is to understand. Books that were written relatively recently, when you read them, they're quite easy for you to understand. It's not a language thing. It's just uh, the way people speak and the terminology, the istilahat. People use changes all the time. Well, I can't remember the last time I read it through like that, that I would be able to recommend it over a book or recommend another book over So the first question, the question is this, uh, the, the qiraat which are ahadiyya or shadha the rare, unusual qiraat, are they from the Ahruf? So here, the first question we have, there's a question in Ulum al-Qur'an, the science of the Qur'an. What is the difference between the Ahruf, the seven Ahruf that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, and the qiraat? I don't even know how to translate Ahruf in terms of English. Okay, I can translate it literally, but I don't know how to translate it in terms of uh, how people would understand it in English. But the Prophet ﷺ spoke about the Qur'an being revealed in seven, let's call it language dialects like that, something like that, seven. The problem is that the word used is ahruf. <laughs> so it's, it, even in English, as soon as I translate it, I bring you an opinion. I'm bringing you what, what my opinion is. But call it seven dialects, no problem. And then we have the qiraat. And the qiraat are more than seven. There are far more than seven qiraat mutawatira. Just the famous qiraat that everybody reads are ten. And that's not, and that's just al qiraat al kubara That's not including the differences among their students and the different ways they recite it. 
There are many, many more than that. The Ahruf, there are lots of opinions about it, but a simple opinion is that it refers to the different ways that the Arabs used to speak. So you have words in the Quran that came in the way that Quraysh used to speak. And you have words in the Quran that came in different ways, the different ways that different Arabic people used to speak, different peoples and different tribes among the Arabs used to speak. And this, this seems to me to be an easy way to understand the Ahruf. So within the Quran, there are so many different words that came with particular meanings. For example, the word Za'im. The word Za'im. Normally when we say, when someone says Za'im, they mean something that is like somebody, uh, somebody thought it was true but it isn't, or somebody claimed it was true but it isn't. But the word Za'im, according to Quraysh, when they use this word Za'im, it means a guarantor. وَأَنَا بِهِ زَعِيمٌ I'm going to guarantee it for you. And that was a word that it was used by particular people among the Arabs like that, but others didn't understand it. And there are other words came in the Qur'an that even the Sahaba among themselves didn't understand until a person said, our tribe, we say this word, and in our tribe it means this. However, the Qira'at didn't come to match those exactly. Rather, each qira'ah has, has a mix of these different things in it. Each different recitation has a mix. Sometimes the differences are just pronunciation. Sometimes the differences are differences in meaning. Sometimes the differences are differences in pronunciation. And all of that is contained in all of it. So they don't, there's no overlap between those two concepts. As for the rare or unusual recitations, the reason we don't take them from the Qur'an is part of the preservation of the Qur'an, right? To keep the Qur'an safe. We take the Qur'an which all of the Sahaba agreed upon with Uthman. They all unanimously agreed that this is the, this is the Qur'an. But sometimes the Sahaba heard the Prophet reciting different things. At least, at least, at a minimum, it's an explanation. If not, a recitation. And that's why when the scholars speak about it, they say, what do we approach them? We don't recite them in the prayer. Uh, for example, فَصِيَامُ ثَلَاثَةِ أَيَّامٍ فِي الْحَجِّ Some of the Sahaba used to read ثَلَاثَةِ أَيَّامٍ مُتَتَالِيَاتٍ فِي الْحَجِّ with the, with the extra word, three consecutive days. Now if you look at the fiqh of the scholars, what do they say about these three days? They say it has to be consecutive. Where did they take it from? From a qira'a shadda. When the Sahabi used to read three consecutive days. But the word consecutive, it doesn't come in the Mus'haf. So we don't call it Quran, but we call it tafsir. And sometimes they call it a rare or unusual recitation. And sometimes they call it a recitation which isn't narrated by lots of people. And only one Sahabi used to recite it. What's the danger in only one Sahabi reciting it? That it does mix with tafsir, right? For example, in the Mus'haf of Aisha, with regard to the statement of Allah, Hafidhu ala salawati wa salati wusta, Aisha had written in her Mus'haf, Salat al Asr, the Asr prayer. Did Aisha used to recite that or did she, was it a tafsir? Allah knows best. Did she used to recite Hafidhu ala salawati wa salati wusta salat al asr? Or was it a tafsir of Aisha? At the least, the minimum, it's a tafsir, right? So we use it to explain the meaning of the ayah. And we don't recite it in the prayer because it's only narrated by one companion and it's not narrated, it wasn't agreed upon by the companions when they all came together and said, yeah, this is the Quran. But some of them heard the Prophet Sallallahu say it. So even if they heard wrong, at least they heard tafsir, right? Minimum they heard is tafsir. Even if they didn't hear Quran, at least, at least they heard tafsir. So it's good for us to help us. But it's very important, and I will mention this, and then we'll probably finish maybe one small question more. It's really important for you to have a good grasp of these sciences of the Quran. 
because the enemies of Islam use these sciences to try to make you doubt the preservation of the Quran. Don't have any doubt. This Quran was preserved by Allah Azza wa Jal. Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahafiq. We sent down this remembrance and we will keep it safe. Allah kept the Quran safe. And part of the evidence for that is the fact that these qira'at are not part of the Quran. That's part of the evidence. Because if this Quran was not safe, every Sahabi who read the Quran differently, we would, some people would read it like this and some people would read it like that. We don't differ. The Quran is what the Sahaba agreed upon in the Mus'haf of Uthman. And what is narrated bit tawatur, mutawatir, and in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's narrated from so many, so many people, there is no doubt about it. As for what is narrated from one companion, and it doesn't match the Mus'haf or one rare reading, so we benefit from it, but we don't mix it with the Qur'an so that this Qur'an is preserved as Allah commanded us to keep it safe. We take one more question, inshallah, and maybe afterwards we could take a few, but I want to give people time to make wudu and everything, inshallah. Yes. Mm. Very good. This is an excellent question. So we said, actually not just wash, the majority of the people who recited Maliki Yawm al-Din, most of the, in fact, five out of seven, they recited it Maliki Yawm al-Din. And only Asim and Al-Kisai, if I'm not mistaken, wa Maliki Yawm al-Din rawihi nasirun, shall be said, wa Maliki Yawm al-Din rawihi nasirun. And if I'm not, if my memory doesn't fail me with a shatibiya, that is uh, Asim and al kisai so there's only two of them recited it like we do. But you made a very good question. How can you mix the two when one of them has alif and one of them doesn't? For this, you have to open the, a copy of the Quran and look at how is Malik Yomiddin written. You're going to see Meem connected to Lam, connected to Kaf, with a little alif written on top. So if you read the little alif written on top, you're going to read Maliki Yomiddin. And if you don't read the little alif written on top, you're going to read Maliki Yomiddin. So if you look at the Mus'haf of Uthman, the old Mus'haf, it's written Meem, Lam, Kaf. And you can read it with a little alif or without a little alif. Some of the scholars read it with a little alif, Maliki Yomiddin, and some of them read it with, without. The little alif, Maliki Yomiddin. Does that make sense? So you'll see it like that. It's nice to look like, how can this be different from this? How can it be different? But when you look at the Mus'haf, you'll see that actually the same word shape, the shape of the word is the same. But it's not only enough for the shape of the word to be the same. It has to be that the Prophet Wasallam read it like that. We can't just say like, for example, I can't just choose to read Malak, for example. I can't just put my own little alif where I like. It has to be how the Prophet read it. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So sometimes he read it Maliki Yawmiddin and sometimes he read it Maliki Yawmiddin and both times it's written the same way. That makes sense? Okay. That is what Allah Azza wa Jal made easy for me to mention. Allah knows best. Was salatu was salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.